I'm joined here by Cindy, the organizer of this Tea Party conference, for lack of a better word, I guess is what you would call it. You invited all the Tea Party leaders from all over the state to come together for a meeting, right? Why? Um, Well, before the election happened, um, I thought I'm really going to want to get together with the co-patriots around the state, regardless of who wins or loses, and it'd be good to get together and regroup. And um, so that's one of the reasons I... I called the meeting, I guess. There's, you know, a couple hundred people in there today. How many how many groups were actually represented there today? Um, I didn't get a final count, but it was, I think, over 45, at least. 45 at least 45 groups, groups right. represented, yeah. Okay. What do you think the common theme was by the time the meeting was over? Um, I think the common theme was an energy and enthusiasm to uh, want to work together and to come together as a united force um, as independent uh, groups. The definition of a Tea Party leader in itself is kind of vague because there is really no real leaders, Mm -hmm. just people that stand up and get something done kind of mentality. And you pulled the whole state together, so I guess we can call you a Tea Party leader. What would you say to all the other tea parties across the country right now? you got your chance to say whatever you want to them. Um, Keep up the fight. Um, One of the reasons, even though we felt maybe frustrated and devastated by the last election, uh, one of the reasons I think we need to keep up the fight, actually there's two. One, for our future generations. It's our responsibility to make sure we hand that torch to freedom off to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And two, for all those that have come before us and paid the ultimate sacrifice and um, given their lives so that we can have freedom and enjoy the blessings that we have now. There's a lot of talk about the Tea Party forming form their own party and breaking off from the GOP because they're sick of the GOP blaming them for losses as one of the reasons, for example. What do you think about a Tea Party party, per se, an actual national party? Mm-hmm. Um, third parties don't have a history of doing very well, so it's not something that... Um, is being thrown out there a lot. But one of the reasons I think it would be considered is not just because of um, what you had said about the GOP, but also what are we getting from the GOP? Um, We've been working a lot and um, working a lot of hours, and and we're looking at what we're we're getting from that. um, How's that working out so far? (laughs) Yeah, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of benefits. Um, And so... A lot of the GOP is literally blaming the Tea Party for being so conservative that they can't get elected. And yet, a lot of the Tea Party are trying to figure out, well, what's the difference between the GOP and the Democrat Party? I mean, really, Mm -hmm. when you look at history, both have run up the debt beyond comprehension. Both have passed bills that strip away your liberties, such as the NDAA and, you know, literally passing the debt constantly going on, never ending spending. These are being done by both parties. So... Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Uh, do you feel like you're part of one of those parties? Well, I think the um, the charges against the Tea Party that it was our fault that we didn't win the elections is absurd for a party that has been established since 1854 to blame that on a, a group of people that have been here for about three and a half years. So sometimes I think the expectations that have been placed on the Tea Party movement are, have just been um, uh, absurd um, as far as the expectations that we're supposed to, to meet. Um, however, at the same time, if you look at the candidates in this last election, um, there were a few Tea Party candidates that um, weren't elected, but there were also many, many, many moderate candidates that weren't elected as well. And so um, I just think those are false charges. I think those, those are scapegoats from the GOP. If you uh, look at Michigan, per se, and, and the victory centers um, that many of us volunteered at for this past election, um, there's lots of reasons that we can see why the GOP has not been as effective uh, as it really could or should be. I've talked to some Democrats that are actually part of Tea Parties themselves. They believe that the Democrat Party has actually lost the values that their parents had once supported the Democrat Party for. What do you say for Democrats that want to come to the Tea Party? 
Um, I say look at our values and what we stand for, and you will see that you'll be benefited by those same values. Um, for my group, the Plainwell Patriots, we have in our leadership team someone who not only was a Democrat, but, but who voted for Barack Obama in the last election. And now he's a Tea Party leader. Um, and he said that he just uh, went along with what sounded good and what looked good. But when he started looking um, deeper into the policies and how they started affecting him and his family, that's when he decided um, those weren't good policies that were being promoted by the Democrat family, and they were actually hurting him. Uh, so that's when he came to our Tea Party. I want to ask you a couple um, questions about what's going on current today. Um, one example is Hostess. The union <laughs> basically just drove an American company right into oblivion because you can't get blood out of a turnip. You can't demand more than it's even possible for those workers to produce. So if the workers can't make their own paycheck, how is a business going to stay in business? Um, I come from a family that has union employees um, and non-union employees. They're all from the east side of the state, and so is my husband. And um, we've seen a lot of history with, with um, the unions, and uh, it's been a concern of ours for a long time. Um, about these patterns that we're, we're seeing uh, within the union system. And I think it's just changed and evolved over the years to become what you have said. It, speaking of hostess, one of the things I heard this morning was that the union um, contract said that they could not um, send in one truck, hostess bread and, and Twinkies, Twinkies. on the same, on the on same, the same truck. truck. And, and so... Um, you know, if, if you think you're going to be able to keep a business going with those kinds of demands, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. And, and then now those people are going to be out of a job, um, which is the ultimate Well, one thing outcome. someone asked me, they said, I have a 401k. I want Wall Street to hire a, an executive that's going to make them money for their retirement and mutual funds to go up. And at the same time, that person said, but the CEOs are making too much money. How, how do you... How do you tell a CEO that you come to work for company A if company B is willing to pay them more money because they can make more money? How does that competition work? And then why are these CEOs um, villainized, I guess is a good word for it. What, what do you tell them? Mm -hmm. Um, I think what I'm seeing spread, the attitude and the ideology that's being spread right now in America, especially with businesses and CEOs, um, has fundamental Marxist um, and socialist ideology. And it, the CEOs do? No, the, I, the ideology being promoted that they're evil, that CEOs are evil, that they're bad, um, that there's somebody else in government that should dictate how much um, somebody should be able to earn um, through their blood, sweat, and equity. And those um, ideas are stem from Marxist ideology, and that's very concerning, concerning to me because those were not the ideas that founded our nation and made us the most prosperous country in the world. You hear a lot of rhetoric about pay your fair share. They need to pay their fair share. One person asked me, he says, how much do you want me to pay to be a U.S. citizen every year? How much do you think someone should pay to remain a U.S. citizen? I don't think you should have to pay anything to remain a U.S. citizen. Well, if he stays a U.S. citizen, he pays about $15 million a year right now in taxes. But if he revokes his citizenship and goes down to Mexico, does the same exact business, he's only going to get charged about a million dollars a year. So it costs him an extra $14 million a year. So he wants to know, why should I stay here? I got to I can afford to go back and forth and do, travel and do whatever I want. So why should I pay an extra 14 million dollars a year just to say I'm a US citizen? What do you tell that man? Right. Um I'm sorry I didn't understand your question before. Um I don't know what I tell him except for the fact that, again, I think it's important that we uh, maybe get that message out and fight for these wonderful ideals that make our country great. And I guess I'm, I'm generally not that person to just give up on those things. So. He, he wants to know how much is enough. How much is his share? That's what he wants to know. How much is his share? I, I, it's a... I disagree with the whole paying the fair share, so I don't know that I can answer that question the way you're wanting me to answer. He's already paying way more than his fair share. Okay, so taxing the rich isn't going to pay off the debt anyway, so 
why drive him out of the country? Because he's quitting in his wealth producing status. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of people that will not have a job now because he's leaving the country. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep those guys from leaving the country that know how to create jobs? I think when they're being told that they're evil. Right, right. Um, I think, and I hope that they would partner with us who are trying to um, stop that kind of Marxist ideology from taking over in our nation, instead reverse it um, to help it go back to being prosperous. So I say fight and, um, and keep that fight here at home. Speaking of fighting, Four Americans died in Benghazi. Do you feel our government is being honest with you? Um, Benghazi has been the topic in the last few months that has probably bothered me the most. Um, seeing the pictures that were on Facebook of our ambassador um, being drug out into the streets and then finding out later that it was blamed by a YouTube clip um, and then later on even that, that they weren't given the help that they had requested infuriated me. I've talked to some military troops, active and retired, and being a retired vet, or a veteran myself, not retired from the military, but a veteran myself, there was one thing we had as a code that we knew that if we were in trouble and we called for help, everyone would come to the rescue. What do you tell the troops when help was asked for and people that were willing to go were ordered to stand down and then the ones that did manage to go, no matter what, got killed for their effort because no one was there for them. How do we tell the troops that we're going to be there for them next time? Um, first of all, we need to tell them that we're willing to fight for a new commander-in-chief. Um, and second of all, I, I agree with you. What, what kind of message does that not just send our troops, but what kind of message does that send to our enemies as well? Absolutely, right? The Federal Reserve's charter is due to end in 2013. It was a 100-year charter. During the presidential campaign, neither party addressed the fact that the Federal Reserve's charter is up for renewal. What do you think needs to be done with the Federal Reserve? Um, I would like to see the Federal Reserve abolished. Um, also around that same time in 1913 was the 16th and 17th Amendment that were passed. And so there was a lot I'm of... I'm not a fan of Woodrow Wilson, so... <laughs> there was a, a lot of coordinated effort going on and, and things that had to be done for all three of those to take place and um, to bring us to where we are now, so... See, the 17th Amendment really hits home with me because um, although, for example, the 16th Amendment, the uh, Supreme Court said did not grant any new powers of taxation on the government, they sure did, so I'm not so sure the 16th Amendment in itself was the problem, but the 17th Amendment... Mm -hmm. That's when we took all the voice of the state away. Mm -hmm. And now you have a two-year elected representative in the House of Representatives, and you have a six-year representative in the House or in the Senate. Mm -hmm. How does the states get their voice back? Because if the states had their voice, Obamacare would never be here. No senator mm -hmm. would stand up against the states. There was already over half the states that sued the government over it. Right. So the Senate is no longer a voice representing the state. What do we do about that? Uh, we need to repeal the 17th Amendment, which is going to be very difficult given that the senators that are in place probably won't go for that. Um, but one of the things that concerns me, and, and I'm just going to take this one step further, is the push for a national popular vote, which would then also, you know, our, our founders put um, a lot of checks and balances in place, and they made every uh, branch elected in a different way. But so with that, the 17th Amendment, that went completely out exactly, of balance. Exactly. It did. It did. And now I see a push to take that even further and to even push it out of balance even further with the national popular vote where we don't have electors. Uh, someone, someone suggested that um, there's two states now that take the electoral uh, college uh, votes and break them up by congressional districts. What do you think that would mean for America? Do you think that would be a way to do it? I do. Um, Maine and Nebraska um, do that, and um, I actually would like to put some proposals um, forward this year in Michigan to have Michigan elect their electors by congressional districts. And I think the benefit, too, is everyone wants their vote to count. And, um, and what they don't understand is if you went to a national popular vote, your vote would now be one of how many people voted in the presidential election. I, but I it wouldn't know. really represent the sediments of that state exactly. no longer. Exactly, yeah. But, but bringing it more local 
and and just having that your vote in that district. So it, breaking it up the electoral col uh, the electoral college based on congressional districts, you yeah. think would bring a little more. Um, uh, power to an individual vote I, that's not buried in a metro city, is that it? I, I do, um, in two ways. Um, one way, if you live in a conservative congressional district and you see in the election every time, oh, you know, Wayne County just voted and now it just flipped all of ours, that can get frustrating, but also it empowers the individual because you can have an influence and impact in your district. It's a lot easier to do that, you know, knocking on doors, making phone calls, putting up signs in your district. You can have a direct influence there. It's a lot harder to have an influence on the whole state. So I think people might feel empowered by that. One of the goals of Liberty Town Hall is to unite the Tea Parties all across the country. How would other Tea Party leaders in other states get a hold of you to start the state-to-state -state interaction that we need to, to make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, they can contact me at plainwellpatriots at gmail.com. Um, and I'm also a member of the Tea Party Patriots, which is a national organization, and so get to communicate with uh, leaders from other states as well through that way. Um, I used to live in Indiana, so uh, hi to all my Indiana friends out there, um, Tea yeah. Party leaders. And, um, yeah, I think that's important that the Tea Parties interact and network amongst states. We have someone here from Tennessee, um, Kurt Potter from Tea Party Patriots. Um, so I think that's a great idea, and they're free to contact me. Well, like I said, Liberty Town Hall is a voice for the Tea Parties. That's that's our sole goal is to give them a, a, a national media platform. So what do you want from me? What do you want me to do to help your battle? Um, I think media um, has done a poor service of... Um, getting information, unbiased information to the people in many ways, whether it be from um, lack of research, lack of vetting, um, lack of just good journalism. And so I guess what I would ask from you guys is that you have high standards uh, for what you do of getting out the truth, and um, you stick to those high standards. And That I promise you. <laughs> and I think that will go a long way. <laughs> Cindy, thank you for joining us today. Thanks. God thank bless. And appreciate all your effort. Thank yep, you. Thank you.